and get into our conversation. Hello to everybody from wherever you are in the world. I hope you've had a very, very good day. We certainly have Chasing the Sun, episode three. Hello, hello. Hello, everyone. How are you doing, Skull? Yes, you're always so happy. I thought I'll wear this cap, but 2019 Springbok World Cup champions. Bro, I asked you to sell it to me. Why don't you want to sell it to me? Uh, this is <laughs> a limited edition, unfortunately. <laughs> And it's uh, just watching this Chasing the Sun brings so, back so many amazing memories uh, of adversity, success, and what we can achieve as a, as a country and people together. So it's, it's unfortunately I got very emotional watching this. Um, miss my friends uh, because I can't call them teammates. As we, I, I actually only slept 15 days and eight months at home. And to sure. share amazing memories with with friends was quite special and then reliving it. Uh, I can't thank Supersport enough. Yeah, it's been extraordinary, even for us, even for uh, people who aren't necessarily rugby lovers. I think they're also getting a sense of just what it takes to play for this team at the highest level. Um, someone is saying the lighting, so if you can find a spot with um, nice lights so we can see you a little bit clearer. Yeah, that's this even better. <laughs> Don't take it off. Don't take it off. <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk about um, you know just pre the World Cup. I mean, you you were the first team to arrive, South Africa, uh, and that yeah. was in the build up to the match against Japan as well. And it was such a hero's welcome that you received. You would have thunk that you guys won it as you arrived in the land um, of the rising sun. So why do you think the Japanese were so excited to see the Springboks in particular? I was just so emotional arriving. Firstly, this is the first time the World Cup has been at an untraditional rugby playing nation. It's always England or France or New Zealand, Australia, South Africa. And the perception was, you know, the Olympics is in a year's time. In 2020, this is just sort of a window dressing. And then you arrive there and the unbelievable enthusiasm of all the Japanese people, the Japanese way. Uh, although I, most of us picked a lot of weight, uh, gained a lot of weight with all the rice we ate, uh, it was just phenomenal. I mean, our first training session, although it was, well, 38 degrees and almost 100, uh, yeah, what well, the humidity was about 100%. Uh, uh, sweating quite profusely, it was intense. But then we, at the first training session, there was about 10,000 Japanese people singing in Kosikaleli and just going absolutely crazy. And I thought, wow, this is a special, special place. It certainly is. And it was also great for us to see, you know, just how the, the, the locals were welcoming you and, and making sure that the team is always good and comfortable. But then that move to go and train at Omiyazaki. Yes. Tell me about those mountains. It, it was, um, South Africa is pretty, but Japan is beautiful as well. I mean, not just, it, it's weird sitting on the floor to eat. It was something for me to get used to. I'm not the most flexible type of guy. And the thing <laughs> is, is, what was amazing about the group was, Whatever the challenge was, we just took it in our stride, you know, embrace the Japanese way, embrace each other and embrace experiences. And that was pretty much what we did. You know, they, well, luckily we had some players that played in Japan so they could sort of prepare us for uh, the Japanese way. But the way they eat, the way they uh, consume all kinds of different uh uh, food was quite unique to to what uh, what our experience in the UK and, and in South Africa was. No braai. Uh, there was a different way of braai. Sure. They, they, they meet, but it was for me just just. I mean, the planning of the the management was superb. We always mm. knew where to go. There was no hassles, and even if there was any problems, it was quite easy to overcome. 
Dongse JJ Fredericks. What a logistics manager, right? And I love even how in the episode he just speaks about the how you guys would firstly help him out. Yeah, put that cap on. How you guys would help him to pack everything into the bus or into the trucks um, and, and move everything around, but also the importance of not spending too much time on the road. How did that help the team? Well, the, the, the beauty was everything was planned. They, there was a recce, recce being done, uh, I think, the year before. They knew exactly where to go and how to go, uh, get you every place. And they, they made sure the timing, there was no time wasted. But then from the team perspective, we didn't just leave it to JJ to pack the bags or for the Japanese people to pack the bags. It was irrelevant if you've got 100 test matches Dwayne or Beast, you know, carrying the bags or Sia, whoever it was. But if there needs anything needs to be done, everybody just climbed in and did their part. You know, there was no, you know, senior players, junior players, let the young boys carry the bags. There was, listen, we're a team here. Irrelevant if you played one game or 20, 100 games, let's help this team. And that was the beauty. And not just the players. I mean, the management went uh, above and beyond to make it easy for us as players. And then you sort of feel guilty, you know, if, if Renee carries the bag, you go, no, please, Renee, just relax. We can do it as well. And even if the boys played, I, 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 I didn't play as much as the other boys, but even the boys that played every game, you know, they, they were there uh, five o'clock in the morning, putting the bags on the bus or the next morning or at evening, you know, irrelevant what the problem was. And that was the beauty of it. Everybody did their part. Everybody did their part in training. You guys did your part as well. Lots of pushing and shoving that we saw in the <laughs> episode. Everybody just going and gunning for it. Yeah. I, I wonder, in the, especially in the lead up to the New Zealand game, you know, Skull, there, there, there's excitement, but there's also that tangible electricity in the air every yeah. time we face the All Blacks. How was this one different? Um... It wasn't different. It was, we, we beat them in Wellington. We drew with them the year after in Wellington in 2019 earlier. And this was sort of, okay, let's, let's go, you know. And credit to New Zealand, we made two errors and they scored two tries. I think it was between minute 22 and 27. Mm -hmm. But not just that, after the game, you know, the belief never left the team normally with a loss you know you build momentum with with winning and even with that loss the way the coaches the management reacted to that and didn't say listen our world cup is gone we we did lose and we lost against a better side but let's learn from that those losses what can we do better and you know if you've got a, a management side that believe in the players you know as players you sort of gravitate to that and then the same thing from the management perspective and the, the beauty of this the squad wasn't just the 1 to 15 or the, the 33 players. It was everyone. You know, we spent so much time together and that, you know, you really knew your, the guy next to you. And although we lost against New Zealand, the belief was always there. Listen, we've lost now, but this is not the end. This might be the, the beginning of something special. And looking at, at that game, you know, a lot of guys asked me after the World Cup, did you plan to lose against New Zealand? Never, ever would you ever put that South African shirt on, that Springbok shirt, representing mm. the country going into a match that you want to lose. Although it worked out in our favor, you know, we still want to win every game. That's true. That's true. And you could tell even from the conversation at halftime in that match and even the muted conversation at the end of the game as well, that, that, that loss hurt and now it's, yeah. it's time to get back uh, on the saddle and coming back was Italy and I remember yeah. I was in studio and we talking it up and talking it up and Nick was like guys we're playing Italy come yeah. on this is a yeah. game that South Africa should win by miles and yeah. that first five minutes just the scrummaging I was like we're back well if you just look at you know at Beastie uh, uh, and Bongi on that first scrum you know when that the tart had went off I just knew you. Okay, this is we've got them. They we're gonna smash them properly. Uh, I know we as South Africans like the physicality, and then the second prop went off, and I went, "Oh my goodness, they actually gonna go and test the scrums." And of course, we went on a six-two split. And I don't know people that don't watch rugby. It's quite significant when you take away our strength. And even on that, the the guys on the pitch said, "Okay, fine." 
we can't can't hurt them anymore in the scrum. We've 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 uh, cut them a little bit, but now we're gonna give me the ball, give me the give them the ball, and we if every every contact point, we're gonna show South Africa that irrelevant, uh, yeah, irrelevant happens on the pitch. We're gonna make it personal, and uh, mm. I, I can see in the game half time. I can see the boys come on, bring everything. We want this. We want to hurt them. We want to, you know, enforce the South African way. And the beauty of it was the coaches had their plan and the players had the same kind of plan and executing that plan. That was the beauty of it. And, you know, even with uncontested scrums, the physicality the boys showed was phenomenal. Sure. It was superb. It was superb. And I think for, for someone who, who might not watch the sports, that might have been the most brutal game they'll see in a while. Because it was just every tackle you like, say right. Say right. <laughs> <laughs> That's it how bad like, it got. <laughs> I was literally sitting in the stands like this and going, oh no. You know, it was, um, and, and that was the beauty of it. I know, so, well, as the Springboks, people say we can be sometimes too direct, you know, not play too flashy. But we said, okay, fine, we've got the pack. Rusty went on a 6-2 split. The boys knew that sort of their game, that they've got 40, 45 minutes to empty the tanks. And we've got a great squad, the bomb squad coming on. And, uh, you know, flourishing, the bomb squad was flourishing. And they go, okay, just give me time on the pitch. I want to go. And what a difference that made as well. Because, you know, the 6-2 split was extraordinary. And it was, it was the ace. It was really the trump card that I think Rossi and the, and the management team had. Because as much as teams see the team sheets and see, okay, 6-2, they don't actually realize just what that means. Yeah, even now, Eddie and a lot of other coaches want to ban the 60 split. They want to make the substitutions less. And, and normally, I think, if you, if you watch the episode, everyone wants to wear the number one, two, three, or four, or be in the starting lineup. You know, but we as a team said, and Rusty focused on it quite intensely about entitlement. What is, not what's important to me or to whoever starts, but to the squad, what is the best for the team? And from that perspective, irrelevant if he picks you at number one, number 33, or number 16 in my position, okay? You know, you want to add to this team. You want to make this team better. And, I mean, a guy like Malcolm that was unbelievable the year before and in the year, he had to put that number 16 shirt. And that just shows the character of the individual. Is it the, the guys that was on the bench that, I don't mind, I just want to be on the pitch. I just want to show South Africa what I can do, you know, and my teammates and earn respect. And from that perspective, it was amazing seeing the bomb squad flourishing, uh, even keep it tight when it needs to be. And then when it doesn't need to be, you know, open the game up, like Archia, the offloads you saw tonight. What a special uh, a group of players. Sure. Certainly were. They certainly were. They were the difference. Start strong, end strong. That was the plan uh, from the Springboks. Then there was that incident with uh, Magazole Mapimpi and yes. the bomb squad as well. And, and just the way that it was depicted, because it is a moment that is captured. It's not a camera that's standing there for a minute or two to, 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 to show context, if, yeah. if anything, really. Because that, I think, is what a lot of people were missing, the context behind it. For yeah. you watching and seeing um, the criticism that came with it, uh, uh, the media storm unfolding, uh, yeah. what did you do to remain focused? Firstly, what did you think of the moment? And what did you do to remain focused on it? Well, well, the interesting part was we didn't know about it till it came out in the media. And France got abused. Mapimpi got abused. And he actually just said, listen, boys, this has got nothing to do or race, religion, nothing. It's, it's just the bomb squad. And I thought, how could Mapimpi, that is uh, a light of hope in our country, get abuse about this? And the amazing part is the senior group, we got together and we wanted to send a combined message out to South Africa and say, listen, this has got nothing to do with your background. And luckily, Rassi, from his perspective, said, listen, irrelevant, there will always be people that try to divide. But let's show a country, well, you'll see this hopefully in other episodes, that that the beauty about our team is we're all different. 
We are from all different races, all different backgrounds, all different religions. But we can show our country that together we are stronger. And true to, to the hashtag stronger together, uh, we try to inspire a nation. And Rassi never, ever spoke about, you know, giving hope to the country till almost that moment and said, listen, forget about South Africa. Let's show South Africa what we can do together. And then it became a very personal um, how can I say, mm. uh, uh, issue to all the players. Because the beauty of everybody thinks we have to be the same, but we don't. Just be, enjoy each other's differences and embrace that. And that is the beauty about being South African. We've got so many different languages, so different cultures, but it, we can learn from each other. And that became very personal, especially when we had time, firstly, to share our personal stories and secondly, embrace our, uh, our differences and then showing the rest of the world that a small little country in the southern uh, part of uh, Africa can make something special happen. And you certainly did. You certainly did. I wonder, you, you are one of the, for me, like the, the, the happy, you are the happiness of the team. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, the old heads who know exactly what they're doing, exactly how to win in big moments, but, but always making sure that the team remains upbeat. Over the years, over your career, and even in the time, especially when you weren't playing for the Springboks, how did you deal with the criticism? How were you able to shut out the noise and just get on with the business of rugby? Well, rugby is actually just the sport. I mean, you know, when you get a wife, kids, the relevance of rugby itself is not important. The big, the big importance for me was always how you treat people. And for me, it's if I'm someone that plays rugby that's on TV every weekend or someone that cuts grass or someone that picks up plastic or take out garbage, that doesn't make a difference of who you are. The, the value of a person or the respect is you've got hard work and how you treat other people. Uh, and... And for me, it has always seen that way and that was ingrained by my school and definitely by my parents is don't judge a, a book by its cover. Value the content. And that is exactly what I see in, in my life. You know, rugby, it's rugby. It's a sport. But people remember a lot longer how you treat them and how mm. you behave. Mm. There was actually a moment I'm remembering now um, with one of the ball boys. Yes. And you were supposed to, you bowed to him and then you <laughs> took the ball. I'm telling you, Scala, like, that's the things that people remember about you. It's, it's, yeah. it's very, it's small. It may be small to you. But to, mm. to someone that is watching, it's like, are you kidding me? It's like getting high five by an angel, really. Because he's looking <laughs> at this big man that's this rugby superstar, but you have all the time in the world for people and to greet people and to make people matter. When did that, that become the Springbok ethos as well? Because I find that all of you guys are exactly like that. Yeah, I think it's ingrained as, as a Springbok and, and especially if you talk about entitlement. And I think... And, and the earlier episodes of Chasing the Dream, it was all about we, uh, a team, not I and what I can get out of it. And I think that was the beauty about it is we are, you wear that shirt, it's, 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 you're not entitled to wear that every day. It's a gift. And life is a gift. Every day is a gift. And from, from my perspective and from the team around, we wanted to, uh, how can I say, connect more with every person out there, not just be putting on a pedestal and be on social media and no one can reach you. It's actually be uh, connecting with the normal person. And we are, all rugby players, are normal. We play this game from an early age. Now you start wearing a Springbok shirt. Your values don't change. You are still that person. But unfortunately, then you are put on a pedestal and you must just be you. Uh, and that's the beauty about it. You're no different to anyone else. Uh, and once again, the team and the players and from the management perspective, you could see they were always open for time, make time to be for people. And that was, I mean, from Ann Lee to um, JJ to myself to uh, Peace or Andre or Vili or Sia, everyone had time for everyone. And that was the beauty of it is 
Yes, we are rugby players. Yes, we are Springboks. But we are no different to any other South African out there. What was your favorite moment of the group stages? Group stages, um, well, the perception, firstly, losing against New Zealand and as a team getting together, enjoying every moment. And, you, you know, it, it's in the change room or I think it was a meeting, you know, even after we lost, Rusty went, listen, guys, let's, let's see this in the bigger picture. Uh, we lost against New Zealand. Yes, we are gutted, but they have to beat us twice to win the World Cup. We only have to beat them once. So in essence, it was like literally, okay, fine. You know, let's, let's make a joke out of it. It is not life and death. People like now during this year, you see people fighting for their lives during COVID, you know, going through a hardship from a financial perspective. And that, that was the beauty of it is during the whole World Cup as a team getting together, you know, a lot of love, uh, and a lot of energy and time for each other. And that for me, during the group stage, what was the best time? Every day. Every day was special. Drinking some different kind of drinks in Japan, eating something lacquer. that was totally weird. So it was so lacquer. <laughs> uh, the captain has also joined us. Yamchana Kolisi is on this live. Thank you for joining us, Skip. Without the people, we can't do what we love or be where we are. No truer words. No truer words. Skulk, I, when did you start to believe? Because it seems Rusty believed from the get-go. When did you start to believe that we're going to win the World Cup? Well, it actually started in 2018. I was sipping mojitos in Ibiza with the family, you know, and getting a text message from Rusty. And as I know Rusty, you know, his he's, uh, planning is superb. Uh, and then, you know... In episode one, you could see, you know, we got, we got in the first 20 or 30 minutes against England, we got uh, quite, th we got thumped, to be quite mm. honest. And the character of that young squad getting together behind the post and Sia and Dwayne having a chat to the boys and then bring it back. And you can't buy character. And to have a team like that turn a game around, you know, I started having belief. And the different thing about this that I've experienced is, Rusty never said, I know all the answers, but let's explore the answers. Let's make, from a statistical perspective, what it gives us the best possibility to win. And then the team, the people, it all comes down to people. You know, you can have the best structures, the best uh, systems, but yet the individual needs to be willing to grow, willing to learn and willing to work hard. And you just had a magical group that was willing to do this, sacrifice so much. And a lot of wives and kids had to sacrifice their husband, their wife, their boyfriend being away for, like me, I only slept 15 days and eight months, as I said, at home. But the sacrifice was actually from their perspective and then from the players. So not just the players had to do that, the management had to do it. I mean, Renee has got a beautiful little boy and she had to sacrifice time with her son. So, and we all said, we are willing to make that sacrifice uh, as players, as management, to give hope and to make a success out of that. And the belief was always there. You know, it's, it's, and the belief was there that if we work hard, win or lose, we're going to give it a great shot. I mean, we had record losses against Ireland and New Zealand. And we thought, okay, fine, we can turn this around and give it a good shot. Got a question here from Businti says, she asks, do you think that working together and having a common goal were the main contributing factors to the victory of that World Cup? Yeah, it was definitely one of the main contributing factors. But in between the beautiful pictures and winning the games and lifting the trophy, there went in a, a lot of planning extremely hard work uh, and sacrifice. I mean, people see you lifting the trophy or making tackles. The team, when it got tough in the match with the humidity, with the pace of play, you have to get up. And that's the thing is, you can't have success without discipline and hard work. And this team was prepared to do that. And yes, we had a common goal, a common goal to, you know, make our country proud. Irrelevant uh, if we win or lose, but show the country that we will put everything on the line to be successful.
And, and that's exactly what we did. We tried hard, we trained hard, and then the management worked incredibly hard hours, long hours, to analyze the opposition. So when we got on that pitch on a, and the whistle, yeah, the ref blew that whistle, we knew what to expect. And then you came back as world champions. You're sitting with the <laughs> Webb Ellis Cup in your dressing room and in walks Prince Harry, of all people, to shake yeah. your hands and say, listen, you guys did the thing. Congratulations. Yeah, how has winning, winning the World Cup changed your life, Skulk? Um, still the same. I'm still Skulk. I'm still happy. Um, doesn't make a difference to who I am. It's, it's, the beauty about this is we gave hope to a country. And um, hopefully they showed in the next couple of episodes the kind of love I felt coming back to Oliver Tumbo. And there's thousands and thousands of people, irrelevant of background, once again, I'm going to say background, race, religion. We were supporting one cause. And places that, mm. that I was walking in townships that I've never been, giving hugs and kisses on the, on, the, uh, on the cheeks. Although now, unfortunately, with social distancing, you can't do this. But At it all. Was, it was just phenomenal. And, and then that gave me hope to our country that, that there will be people that want to do, divide us, but we are an amazing nation. We are so diverse, but that's the beauty about it. And um, for me, that was what changed me is giving hope. That's why I came back from the UK to South Africa is to make a change and a positive change and add value. Got a question here from Lumisi Lefizola. I love it, actually. Says, Skalk, how do you think we can keep cool heads and look to maintain our form and dominance for a few good years? I think luckily for the first time ever, from a rugby perspective, uh, we've got contingency, and that's very important for success. Uh, we've got most most of the players that unfortunately French are low and and um, beast retired, and uh, but it's pretty much the same squad, same management, and uh, hopefully Rassi has now taken a more strategic role. Jock has taken over, and hopefully now, you know, they can build on the success of 2019. One thing I do know is Jock is a a very tough taskmaster, and you make sure when the lines come. 2021, uh, the boys will be ready. Unfortunately, I want to see the Springboks, but I think it's a great decision from from Sara to just uh, not to play the um, the, uh, the the championship um, in mm. a couple of well, weeks. Really, as you can see, the Australians today and the New Zealanders they are match ready, fit and fit and contact ready. Scott, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Before you leave us, I wanted to ask you. What are your three greatest accomplishments? Um, firstly, finding a wife, keeping a wife, and then definitely my kids uh, is amazing. But for me, for me, uh, accomplishments, I see it more as a journey. Uh, every day is special. You know, meeting someone that helps me and I can help and Vice versa. Uh, accomplishment, people see it as set goals. For me, it's enjoying the journey. And at the, the young age of 39, I'm still enjoying every moment of my life. And we live in a special place and we've got special people. And uh, for me, hopefully, I can give a lot of love to all, all people out there. I love that. Absolutely love that. Skull Prince, one of my favorite Springboks of all time, the man with the big smile, brings all the happiness, and aging like a bottle of fine wine, fine wine. A World Cup winner at 38, that's no small thing, guys. That is no small thing at all. Congratulations on all that you've achieved. Uh, congratulations on, on, on the work that you've done, because I imagine a lot of people were pretty skeptical about your inclusion in that team, and you showed that rugby goes beyond the pitch, it's so much more than just the sport. And, and you were the catalyst to show us just that. I'm so proud of you. And I'm proud of everything that you're going to get up to in the years to come. Because I know you won't, you won't leave us hanging. And yeah, keep smiling. Lots of love, everyone. Thank you for uh, taking time to uh, listen to our chat. And uh, yeah, enjoy Sunday night. And good week on uh, next, or next week. Have a great week. Ciao, ciao. 
How fun was that? Bye, Malan. Ciao, ciao. Scope Brits, everybody. One of the 31 of that rugby, uh, 2019 Rugby World Cup winning squad, Springbok squad. And uh, what a Joel he absolutely is. And, and, and a great, great man. You would have just seen how much he's enjoyed or enjoyed being in Japan and being part of this team. And, you know, the, the love, the energy, the happiness. He's the happy juice of the side. And, and everywhere that he goes, there's only big smiles and good banter. So thank you so much for joining us. Episode three of Chasing the Sun, done and dusted. We've got two more episodes to go. Man, oh man, it's getting closer and closer to that big moment. But keep, keep watching, guys, every single Sunday on Mnet at 6 o'clock. I imagine this is causing a buzz around the world, and I'm sure your World of Champions will be announcing very, very soon where you can also get it if you cannot watch it on our packages. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have an awesome Sunday. See you again next week for Chasing the Sun and then the Chasing the Sun chat. Got another special guest coming up. For myself, Mosidi Simohono, good night.